Well, good morning, everybody. Russ Barkley here again with your weekly research roundup. As always, we will start with a dad joke. And here we go. I only seem to get sick on weekdays. I guess that means I have a weekend immune system. <laughs> Pretty sick. Uh, okay, I got, I got one more for you just to make up for the fact that I didn't have one last week. I took a friend into my garage and I pointed at my ladders and I said, that's my stepladder. I never knew my real ladder. Oh, that is so sad. So I, I know you're looking at me in my bathroom. Hey, I'm retired. Cut me some slack, okay? Uh, and also, I was having a bit of nostalgia for the pandemic chic that we all went through when we were locked down by our governments a few years ago. So I just thought I'd stay in my bathroom for a little while longer. And I know you're saying, but Russ, you didn't even comb your hair for this morning. Ah, but I did. And maybe later, I'll tell you the nursing home where I get my hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to be like this when you get old. You know, you just don't care all that much anymore. All right, we're going to start out this week's research roundup by an article that was published over in the Journal of Attention Disorders. This is an article that comes to us out of Israel, and it's a study of 66 children who were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. As you know, MS is a uh, a type of autoimmune disorder in which it's believed that inflammation and infections trigger the immune system to attack certain structures uh, in the brain, including the myelin that protects and uh, insulates the nerve cells in the brain, and that the longer it goes on, the more destructive and the more widespread the brain injury becomes. Uh, in this paper, they took these 66 children and grouped them into those who did and did not have ADHD, those who had cognitive impairment, but not ADHD, those who had both, and those who had neither. Uh, and the results show uh, that a whopping 47% of the children who had MS also had ADHD. That is astounding. That is about six to eight times higher risk than in the general population. They also found that about 44% had some degree of cognitive impairment, even if they didn't have MS. So you're looking here at over 90% of them had one or the other type of cognitive impairment, thinking of ADHD as a cognitive disorder of executive functioning, of course. Uh, and then they broke the groups down and took a look at uh, how long the disease process had lasted, and they found that among those who had ADHD and cognitive impairment, they had the longest duration of multiple sclerosis, suggesting that the longer the MS process is going on, the more destructive and the more widespread that destruction becomes, producing the risk for not only cognitive impairment, but also specifically for ADHD as well. So uh, I thought the paper was important. It's one of the first, if not the first, I've seen on uh, the rate of ADHD in children with MS. MS, of course, is very rare in children, constitutes only about 5 to 10% of all cases of MS occur in the pediatric population. So you can imagine how rare it is. But again, showing that ADHD is a neurological disorder and that various conditions that affect brain development or that can injure the brain have the potential to produce ADHD, in this case, a more acquired type of ADHD than the usual familial genetic form of ADHD we're used to talking about here. Okay, next up is a second study. This is out of Japan. This is a study on the availability of dopamine within certain structures of the brain, specifically the basal ganglia. Now, the basal ganglia is a set of structures and not just one thing. Each of those smaller structures has an important role to play in brain function. We're not going to cover that at this point, but I thought what I would do is to show you at least where this is coming from. So let's open up our uh, PowerPoint here that uh, I use for my lecture on etiologies of ADHD. And here we go. Look here. This is the striatum which is part of the larger basal ganglia area here in the central part of the brain, responsible for the top-down control of behavior by thinking, plans, and uh, uh, action. <clears throat> so guiding behavior over time toward goals 
using our thoughts and plans. It's also important for controlling our attention span, basically inhibiting distractibility. Uh, and you can see it again here in this diagram from the Washington Post. And what you're seeing here is the larger set of structures of the basal ganglia, including, by the way, the nucleus accumbens. Excuse me for a moment, just had to clear my throat. The nucleus accumbens, as you know, is the reward center of the brain. It imparts a certain amount of motivational reward or incentive to stimuli and events that are coming into the brain to what makes things interesting to us and motivates us to explore them and seek them out. And we know that people with ADHD, uh, when they take stimulants, this is one of many areas in the brain that the stimulants are activating is this reward center, making things more interesting and therefore improving our attention span. Okay, enough of the brain. Let's go back to the article. Uh, in this article, they compared 20 adults with ADHD who had never taken medication to 20 healthy control adults. Why is it important to study drug-naive patients? Because there's a bit of evidence that suggests that if you take stimulants over the long term, they can result in an increase, perhaps permanently, in dopamine availability in the basal ganglia. So uh, we want to make sure that we're not contaminating the study here with people who took medication, because even in the short run, while medication is active in the brain, it is increasing dopamine within these structures, among other parts of the brain that that is happening to. So then when they compared these two groups of adults using single photon emission tomography, a form of spec scanning, they also used a bit of iodine as a contrast agent, a tracer so they could measure dopamine in the basal ganglia. What they found was a significant reduction in dopamine availability in the nucleus accumbens, as well as in other structures such as the caudate nucleus as well. Uh, so reduced dopamine in the reward center of the brain, of course, fits very nicely with earlier studies that suggested that. Uh, fits also nicely with the genetics of ADHD, in which we know that the gene or genes that create the dopamine transporter, which helps to move dopamine out of the synapse into the neuron after the cell has fired and released its dopamine, that people with ADHD may have more of these transporters and therefore less dopamine outside their nerve cells when the nerve fires. Um, so uh, all indicating lower dopamine availability in the centers of the brain. And of course, as I've said, we know that stimulant medication activates these parts of the brain among other parts. So a very nice study out of Japan published over in Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences Reports. We're going to wrap up this week's research review with an interesting paper, one of the first that I've seen, uh, that comes out of the Tufts University uh, Dental School. Uh, and this is a large population study of more than 11,000 individuals who sought dental care there. And they classified these individuals based upon whether or not they had ADHD and whether or not they were taking stimulant medication. Uh, and then they looked at the rate of oral facial pain complaints in these individuals. And uh, what they found in this large study is that individuals with ADHD only reported more jaw pain. So uh, that appears to be linked to ADHD specifically. However, individuals who were taking stimulants, whether or not they had ADHD, complained of greater jaw clenching uh, and also headache, which, as you know, can come from jaw clenching. So those appear to be specifically related to the medication. That fits rather nicely with a lot of research in looking at the side effects of stimulants in kids and adults, where we often hear them complaining about teeth cl clenching, TMJ, and in this case, headache as well. So uh, I think a very interesting paper showing us that people with ADHD may be more prone to jaw pain, 
but people taking stimulant medication may be more prone to jaw clenching and to headache. Okay, everybody, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the dad jokes uh, and the other humor here. After all, when you get old like this, you're less concerned uh, about uh, appearances and much more concerned with paying it forward. So if you're not a subscriber, please think of subscribing. Uh, if you want to know about all the other research that was published this week, it's over in the description that goes with this. And as always, I've given you the link to the three articles that I discussed here. So thanks for joining me. Please recommend the channel if you're enjoying this content and think other people might benefit from it as well. Okay, everybody, I'm going to see you next week. And as always, I sign off with my admonition to be well. Thank you.